Hey, it's Jeffrey from Ahead of the Curve. Today I had an amazing conversation with Heather Gallagher, who was the Director of Technology for Burning Man for the past 17 years. 17 years, crazy, right? So we spoke a lot about the infrastructure of Burning Man, some of the technology behind it, and how it grew and evolved to what it is today. So check out the episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ahead of the Curve. Today I have Heather Gallagher on the show with me. Heather, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeffrey. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation to join. You know what? I've been saying welcome to the show. I really should be saying welcome to the conversation. <laughs> As I mentioned before, I'm trying to stray away from that, but I just can't get away from the word show. It's just too easy. You know, but now that we're all our own Zoom stars, every day is a show, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's pretty true, actually. I kind of like the filter you've got going on on your camera as well. I keep these on for uh, every single call and meeting and appearance that I have, it makes it makes me happy. It makes other people happy, and this technology exists. Like, why why doesn't everybody have sparkles? You know, we <laughs> sparkles for the people. <laughs> I did a few shows a few times back where I was using Snapcam uh, to use the filters, the overlays, and it's really really interesting and pretty powerful. But I I had a time where I was just having way too much fun, and they had a an effect that wasn't like an eggplant storm. So I had eggplants falling off of me and bouncing off my shoulders, which was definitely a, uh, a memorable a memorable uh, a time for, for a few people. And yeah, it was kind of crazy, kind of went a little overboard with the filters. Admittedly, it can be a little disruptive, but you know, I've been working in the augmented reality industry. So me and my previous company, you know, like this was just professional research and almost an obligation. And our, our CEO would run meetings with, you know, giant, crazy virtual <laughs> design and, you know, we're in the biz, you know, we got to do it. Why not? Of course. That's, <laughs> me giving you permission. That's me giving you permission. <laughs> <laughs> so Heather, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of where you started and how you got into Burning Man and kind of the journey that you've taken so far? Sure, I'll try and keep it the short version. Um, you might not know it by looking at, at me right now, but I, I came through the very traditional East Coast corporate world and, and did a decade <laughs> of a master's degree in computer science. And I spent a decade in doing uh, consulting for corporate telcos, actually, mostly, and some integration work. So that was three letter acronym, global service companies. I used to wear a suit and pantyhose. I think we know. I think we know most of those three-letter acronyms. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, and and then uh, moved west and discovered uh, Burning Man, and realized what was I doing with my days? You know, beige cubicles, beige pants, and you realize you're helping big companies just kind of scrape pennies from the masses, and like there's got to be more. Um, and to ask about how I got into so, so my name's Heather Gallagher. Um, I started as traditional technologist, and then I went on to be the head of technology for Burning Man for about 17 years. Um, and then in the last year, plus some change, I've been working in immersive augmented reality, just to catch everybody up. Um, yeah, so uh, I ended up uh, joining Burning Man. You know, I went to it and was like, oh, my people, my place. <laughs> you know, like stepping into frame on your on your life and and having been surrounded by creative people even before um, I found that community you know some of my original musical friends said always surround yourself with the most creative human beings you can you know I just instinctively like I'm with the band or the one in the costume like that's always where the that's always where the really interesting experiences and pe people are and so once I discovered yes. Running Man I, I went in whole hog and uh I volunteered. That's how I ended up getting the position. I was volunteering as a photographer. That's why you'll see my handle of people in Burning Man call me camera girl because my first job was um, sort of as an internal photographer and taking pictures at the event and behind the scenes and things that were happening year round and kind of the story behind the event. And nobody had really done that. That was the beginning of um, really the beginning of digital photography. There was no Facebook, there was no Flickr, there was none of that. Um, it was literally the first couple generations of digital cameras. And so I was doing that sort of as fun and, and sort of to get away from my traditional, you know, corporate job and then kept holding on and kept volunteering. And eventually um, as some things moved in the organization, I had, had made a re relationship and then I started running technology for them. Um, so, so was that your very first experience with Burning Man? Like you'd never gone to the event as a burner before? It was. Oh no, hey, 
No, I I went once. I went once as a as a participant, and then when I came back, the that was in two thousand, and when I came back in two thousand one, I was a, a now then working as a photographer for the the Center Camp Cafe. That's the giant uh, structure that's sort of at the heart of the city, um, kind of the town hall area, um, and so starting from year two and every year since then until this year with COVID, I was out there for a month every year um, helping to produce the event in one way or another, you know, for a couple of years um, as a photographer and then for many, many years running the technology. So this was an interesting year to not go to the desert for a month <laughs> at all or at all. You know, I would say that there are pros and cons to that at the same time, right? Like yeah. you're, not, you're not coming out a week later coughing up, you know, coughing up sand and dust. Um, there was a lot less laundry, a lot less. <laughs> <laundry>. uh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> or cleaning off vehicles, or just throwing them out, or just yeah. you know, disposable yeah. items. Yes. yes, a lot less disposable items. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say hi to Priscilla and, and Christy. Christy, thank you again so much for everything that you've done, and uh, I also want to say hello to one more sponsor who have also been helping us promote the show. It's been awesome. So Heather, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, you know, how you've already kind of mentioned, of course, how you got in, involved with Burning Man, but you know, how did that transition happen as you kind of mer merged into the position that you had while you were there? You know, it was interesting because I was volunteering and doing things like photo editing the website, and I was doing things that just were interesting to me and that I, that I loved, but that were sort of scratching my creative itch um, outside of my corporate job. Um, and then, um, as I was volunteering for the technology teams and learning things there, you know, it turned out, you know, I was qualified, you know, to, to help lead in that capacity, but it wasn't a clear step, you know, it was kind of like I'm doing stuff for fun, but then as I, I kept edging, edging closer to things that were relevant, more relevant to my experience, of course, it's all now my experience, <laughs> I kind of went persistent. Honestly, I kept, you know, I kept sort of knocking on the door of a couple people and being like, hey, I'm here, I'm interested, I'm available. Um, I, you know, here's my here's my big fat resume. I actually, I have a resume. <laughs> actually, this is crazy. I created this huge scroll photo mod. This is this is the kind of Scorpio crazy I am, Jeffrey. I created this huge scroll photo collage <laughs> of all the different ways I contributed to the community. Little, you know, like little tiles over like a timeline and photo galleries and projects. And I printed it out on a photo printer and I delivered it with my resume. Now this was on a, a scroll of paper that wasn't even designed to go through this style of printer, but I had like propped it up with like books and clips. And I, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, have you ever You're done creative? Uh, so I'm crazy and creative. Um, you know, but it was sort of a form of storytelling and it was something that I, I wanted to do um, to supplement and to help understand my, you know, people understand my commitment and to demonstrate, you know, what, what I was doing for the community and intended to do and to like just kind of stand above the rest because there's a lot of people who are interested in doing things. Um, I don't know if that exact piece worked, but just being around and being a part of conversations and having established a reputation um, and, and being somebody that they already trusted was very helpful. And so actually I was traveling and, and I got an email that said, just what do you want to do around here? And I'm in China. <laughs> and I was like, ha ha ha, you know, I'm going to learn a certain programming language and take over so-and-so's job. And then they said, well, be careful what you ask for. Um, we want to talk with you when you come back. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So it was a relationship that was built over years, you know, um, and persistence and a little bit of creative craziness thrown in. <laughs> I think we all need to have a little bit of creative craziness. Like that's just kind of like part of what you need to have. You have to be a little bit insane in general to be inside of this industry, like inside of tech, inside of creative technologies, inside of just about anything creative. You got to be a little tiny bit loopy upstairs to kind of crank out things that we do. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, sometimes in the traditional world, I came out of, you know, with suits and the corporate. The, the purple sparkles, right? Or the colors on your resume or whatever were for, you know, for boat and you didn't do things like that. No, of course, everything then, was trim, trim and proper. Yeah, and then there's that moment where you're like, you know, and, and shifting the Burning Man and doing things like that was like, 
if they don't want me and my purple sparkles, and these days I'm like, you know, dreadlocks are coming to whatever the, the gig is, you then I don't want to be there either, you know? So it's fine if some people are not comfortable with it, but the places I wanna be need to be places where people, um, you know, can be really comfortable and accepting and thriving on somebody's harmless, fun creativity, you know? <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about like uh, the tech side and how you kind of how the evolution, I guess, of Burning Man kind of happened over the course of the time that you were there. I, I'd love to hear maybe a story or, you know, past experience that you remember from some of the times that you were working there at Burning Man. You know, maybe some highlights <laughs> of times where things kind of changed or evolved or you know, anything along those lines? Does anything come to mind? I mean, there's, there's so many stories. <laughs> I mean, you know, the arc of it, I mean, you know, literally when I sort of took helm of the technology, you know, there was under 10 technology paid staff. It was a, a bunch of open source hackers who blessed their hearts, you know, and, and some early pioneers in the internet who had done the very first Burning Man websites. And they were now just sort of, you know, as advisors once in a while, bless their hearts. And well, I was gonna say, actually, sorry, I was going to say going back 17 years, I mean, you're really kind of transitioning out from basically, I mean, that was kind of the, as you were mentioning, the earlier days of the internet, we're kind of going from like uh, AIM and we're going from uh, like beep bulletin board services kind yeah. of over to more centralized internet. I remember actually hosting my own bulletin board service with my brother. Yeah. And all those times listening to modems ringing along and trying to connect to these different bulletin, hot bulletin board services yeah. or. I think we were a little bit past the dial up modem, but maybe, maybe not entirely. Yeah, so you know the website where there's one there's one website it was flat html you know this might even have been before css and the volunteers were you know a distributed authoring team of folks who as changes came in from the you know from the the organization or as things need to get said those people would voluntarily take their time and make changes to the web pages and push it through the change control and every single photo, you know, I was doing a lot of the photo processing and there was some collaboration tools that were, um, that were done on a platform called Plone, which was an old open source uh, project that was well intended, but more for the engineers than for the humans, you know, and, and, and the event site, at the event site, there was one location that had internet and that was a bit of a dial up, you know, T1, you know, point to point super sketch. And that was for the box office to be able to sell tickets. Right. That makes sense. Um, you know, and then you got to get people there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and at that point, you could still sell tickets at the gate. So you also needed to like, you know, take, take sell them tickets like, you know, and so then just for comparison, I'll come back to maybe some interesting stories. So for comparison, you know, as I, you know, it grows alongside you and you're in it and you're just tackling the next problem or with technology, you're always just, you know, you're tending to a piece of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What needs to be replaced now? What needs to be plugged in? What needs to be integrated? What thing is no longer being supported? You know, I mean, it, 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 it's it's just this living amorphic thing when you're doing technology, you know, at that level or as it grows, because every there's always something, you know, whack-a-mole. There's always something that needs to be pruned, fixed, replaced, upgraded. And it's just all about what, what you know, making the decisions about what you can do. And, and you, and then, you know, you're, you're like, okay, now we're in meetings. <laughs> Yeah. And then and then you know that there's important things going on because it means so much to you, but you know, the whole time you're just in service and and realizing, you know, it's just you've been solving problems and bigger problems and different problems. And then and then as I left, it's like, okay, we went from one website to literally 46 unique websites and they probably launched another four or five this year each of each of which is now hosted on you know using the tool wordpress with yeah. a very um beautiful distributed authoring and publishing system that my previous team made so that the content people could make their updates and do some other things without breaking the rest of the website um and 
you know, integrated gallery tools, um, you know, the login, the central login with your burner profile to try to make it easier for people so that we're not asking, you know, we weren't asking for the same data over and over and over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, you know, from, from, you know, we had 40 different software vendors when I left, you know, the, um, and then in the event site, we then had 72-ish on, Black Rock City locations that needed something. And that would be either soft custom software, out of the box software, internet connectivity, equipment, tech support, printers, you know, so, so, so there's an arc and scale, right? From one website to 46 and from maybe one location in the desert that needed internet to 72. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a quite a big scale to say the yeah. very least. Yeah, that was, that was cool. Um, yeah, and a few pivotal moments was the big switch from, you know, going into like WordPress websites and then switching to nonprofits. So then rebuilding and redesigning and relaunching and, and coming out into a new, you know, into, into the burningman.org was big. It took us a long time to get into a graphical newsletter. That was a several year conversation. <laughs> And, and also, you know, there is there is also a fair amount of sales force that we that has been that was implemented, and there was a lot of resistance to that. Well, because, the, uh, you know, Burning Man grew. It went from a pretty small event out in the middle of nowhere to this yeah. monstrosity over yeah. years. Yeah, and there was a lot of resistance to some of these sort of big name tech because you know it's definitely more an open source culture. Um, but you know, as as a technologist, I had to say, you know. I, I appreciate that. Here's what it takes. You know, there's no such thing as free software, by the way, because um, you have to support it, maintain it, update it, feed it. You have to feed it for eternity. And yeah, trust me, working in that industry right now, I yeah, yeah. I, I totally get it. And when you're when you need when you need world class functionality or world class scalability or world class security as a little event company or a nonprofit. Um, you know, you have to have, you know, I've did these decisions with other, you know, technology advisors and, and um, volunteers and friends, and we'd walk through the whole thing of, gosh, we wish we could take this risk. But knowing that there is a quarter of a million or a half of a million people or more who are going to come hammering on this thing or are going to have an opinion about it or who are going to be let down if it doesn't work the way they expect you know the internet to work these days then you have to go for what ends up being more conservative choices you know um anyway so and and one of my um you know before i left obviously it was a big deal to leave but you know one of the legacies i you know left behind was a big call to action about really embracing technology and and you know, showing up for the trainings, and you know, and and, and you know, not, not being quite so timid with all the tools, and, and yeah. even though it was a cultural company, it need we needed it needed to start acting a bit more like a tech company. You know, we're not a tech company. I was like, you, you don't have to be a tech company, but you have to be on the scale of this to this. We have to be a lot closer to being a tech company. And I wrote a strategy and documents and staffing plans and and you know, really laid the foundation for what needed to happen. And then a year later, COVID happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and everyone was like, I think that's like the headline of 2020, COVID happened. And and then and then the whole organization and the whole community and the whole event then catapulted into some very, you know, front leading technologies. And everyone was like, you called it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say them, you know, kind of going back and saying, we're not a tech company to all of a sudden, hey, we're a tech company. We got to well, figure this out. To which I say anybody who's in business in 2020, 2015, 20 has to be a tech company. Like literally, you know, the good news is a lot of the tech in some ways has gotten easier to use, you know, blogs and yeah. websites and all that. Faster. Things have gotten easier. I mean, yeah, absolutely. But, I maintain our own website through WordPress, yeah. which is... Yeah. Super easy these days. There's plugins for everything. It's but when you're when you're managing when you're coordinating and supporting and fostering a community of people all around the world, you know that that becomes an you have much greater considerations for data handling and usability and and 
all of that. Um, and, and plus half of them have fake names and 47 email addresses. And <laughs> the same problems. I do, Alias, aliases for days. I, I did also think that some of the next leadership would might come from gaming. I said, well, let's see, who's got experience managing a global community of weirdos with fake names? I was like, oh, <laughs> gamers. <laughs> <laughs> and they figured out a hacking lot of things. groups. You got to go and get hacking groups. Yeah, hacking, yeah. hacking groups would be yeah. ideal. Just get a yeah. hacking group. Oh yeah, yeah. We, oh, we had some some of those friends on the inside too. Anyway, <laughs> um, you know, pivotal moments there were growth and or having to make the decisions to adopt something that maybe felt a bit more enterprise, but having to recognize you have enterprise needs, and then and then the the catapult, you know, of the entire organization into into the digital realm has been fascinating so i've been cheerleading along the way <laughs> well i imagine as well you know 17 years ago uh everything that was built out there was kind of more conventional you know evolving into stuff that's coming in more digitally and people looking for more power and more power support more as you mentioned more connectivity you know starting to set up these huge projectors in the middle of the desert to start projection mapping things and bringing in millions and millions of lighting fixtures and little light nodes and you know, really starting to dig into the technical, well, not the technical, but the more visual, like digital video and mm -hmm. visual digital age. I can and imagine that there was like, it, everything just kind of went out of proportion exponentially. Cause I remember there was people that were going out there, you know, like a month in advance to kind of stake out their position, their place and start building. Well, so you have to also remember that, and, and my hat is off to, to the, all the creative and technology folks and the Go AV Club, you know, for every one of those camps and projects, because each of those is its own just magnificent glory, you know, or failure in itself, <laughs> you know, and, and our job was to, to, was to maintain for the infrastructure, right, for the container so that those things would happen. But when it came to power and, and you know, and things, they had to be self-sufficient and we really, the organization did not give internet to the participants because it's it's a scarce commodity. It's the it's a rural rural Nevada, yeah, um, Desert, middle of nowhere. Bandwidth is is not cheap. It it takes many many internet relays and towers and dishes and an entire team of humans to make it so that Black Rock City can run safely. And the priority's got to be the hospital and you know infrastructure and things like that and then some of the groups would come collaborate with us and they kind of get um, access to the network as long as they used various config files and played by certain rules and then and they did their own setup and then um, we, we always had the ability if we needed to the agreement was you can come play and share the, the backbone pipe if you will but if we need to we, we're going to shut you off you know <laughs> we're, we're, well you have to if if somebody you know because internet traffic can get weird right oh yeah yeah trust yeah breaking video can weird, it can get crazy and, and, and if somebody if somebody has got the wrong configuration in their thing that they're trying to do and it's pegging your bandwidth for the entire city you have to make priority decisions and obviously people's safety and the infrastructure of the event is always going to be the highest priority yeah but those absolutely. folks did amazing things but they were all they had to be almost entirely self-sufficient you know, that it's not, you know, bring your sets with you, bring your programs with you, don't expect to get on the internet out there. And then they're still pulling off world, some of the best productions that you've ever seen, you know? Yeah, it's quite yeah. incredible. It's quite incredible the things that, that came out of there um, year after year, seeing just some of these huge, huge, huge uh, spectacles, you know, being created and experiences being created out in the middle of nowhere was quite phenomenal and all the infrastructure that was put into place, you know, the building of these these huge structures and statues and all this crazy stuff you'd never expect to see in the middle of the desert, you know, just show up and be there. So um, it's one of my favorite things still is, still is. <laughs> We're still family. So I see that you've been migrating into the world uh, of AR and VR and extended reality and a lot of stuff that we've been speaking about on the show uh, this this year, because it's kind of been the hot thing and uh, kind of the main source for a lot of people's income these days. Um, 
as you were moving, kind of transitioning, of course, digitally this year, maybe you could talk or tell us a little bit about, you know, the involvement that you had this year and the transition of Burning Man going digital. Sure. Um, you know, I'll also first start by saying that, you know, when I left Burning Man, I looked out and I said, what on earth could be as interesting as this, right? <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the lights and lasers and spectacle and giant sculptures and, and so many, so much, so much wonderful human creativity and, 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 you know, mixed realities, augmented reality, virtual reality, you know, extended reality, whatever you want to call it, creative technology, you know, things used for productions and entertainment, as well as some transformative technologies, you know, for wellness and, and personal well-being, those are the only areas that were even remotely interesting to me, you know, and 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 especially the immersive technologies and virtual realities and and um, augmented realities because I I've, and I've done keynotes on this that this is literally the new uncharted canvas for humans to play in, right? I mean, much like the Black Rock City Desert or the Black Rock you know Desert or the Internet was. As, and uh, for some people, they've been doing this now for a decade, but for the most people, it's still just coming into the common, you know, the awareness of the common person. And so when yeah, I said, what would be interesting is Burning Man, I looked out and I said, this mixed reality, I mean, we get to make a whole new dimension out of light and holograms and 3D worlds and, you know, as, and it's uncharted and it's, and they're still ungoverned in certain ways, you know, it's the wild west. And so I thought, okay, I want to go do that. I want to go play there. <laughs> wild West, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Wild West, blinky lights. Like, come on, any questions? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, yeah. So that's a little bit about how, and you know, and I wanted to. I definitely wanted to do something interesting and, and awe-inspiring with my time. And then, lo and behold, you know, um, it, 2020 happened, and and Burning Man had to, you know, make make the decisions about what to do or not to do. And you know, I will. I, my hat is off to. They had 10 different platforms, nine or 10, depending on what things you count and which ones actually happened. And Burning Man took the approach, um, which is a way that the organization has approached lots of challenges, which is let's see what the community, let's see what surfaces from the community, right? So much of the content of the, of the event. And, and after a lot of, um, relationship building and, and uh, conversationing, you know, these nine or 10 platforms emerged, these multiverses emerged. And rather than just pick one and kind of name that as like the thing, they enabled these 10 different things to be <laughs> their own thing, which is both crazy and genius, right? Um, and, you know, exactly. and, and yeah. If it's you're gonna dive into the fire, you might as well like pour ga as much gasoline as you possibly can onto it, toss yeah. the match and just leap. Yeah, and if you're gonna do a hard thing once, you might as well do a hard thing ten different ways once. Yeah, or why not? Have people do, but it also gives every if different people could rally a team around each of these platforms, um, and pull it off, then you might you know great enable that right. Like it's their art, right? This is now the birth of a new kind of Burning Man digital art in ways that people you know a whole new version of creativity is now sprung out of the side of this thing. Well, the other thing too is like uh, the one thing that I've loved about talking about digital art, virtual reality, and like these metaverses and the metaverse itself as a whole is that you can really, uh, you can build whatever you want. You know, like there is no limitations to physics. There's no limitations to anything. You can just create and build and you can create these enormous crazy environments and worlds that you just can't do in real life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even the coolest Burning Man sculpture still has gravity. Yeah. <laughs> That's proven over and over again, you know. So so my role this year was was literally cheerleader. You know, <laughs> apparently I knew apparently I had some foresight that this was coming and I got into the industry. Um, you know, that's why I'm saying my hat, my virtual hat is off to those every single, you know, every single team that worked on the platforms and then the, the artists and the people who showed up and contributed 
Um, you know, so I made it my mission to really, to really cheerlead, to, to dive deeply uh, and to go on sort of a safari of these different platforms um, and to, to tell people about them and to encourage people into it. It's a very new thing for a lot of folks. And to, I'm continuing to invite people into some of the platforms, you know, come on, I'll, I'll meet you there. We can go to Burning Man, like literally tonight, <laughs> we can fly. Um, and so I can't take any, you know, I can't take any credit for what was accomplished this year, uh, other than, you know, hopefully, you know, helping some people understand what's possible. I did get invited to many of the platforms early, um, just so, a little little preview to kind of give a little yeah, I mean, and input. Knowing people, having been the head of technology for the organization, working in mixed reality. I mean, come on, it was basically like a convention for my entire professional career <laughs> that just happened. Um, so I, I did, I just made it my point to sort of support those folks and and to check it out. And and also to kind of whisper into a few friends, you know, ears and who are still in the organization of like, well, here's how, what I would do and, you know, and, and kind of give some, some advice and some encouragement um, and uh, just check in with some of the teams about how they were going. Um, yeah, so I can't take credit other than I participated the heck out of this year, um, and I salute all the folks who did it because I know I know what a tremendous amount of work it is. We were we were joking a few of us who um, have produced Burning Man for you know decades, and there's all there's been a bit of a stigma, you know, or some people like to say, oh, all these tech people, you know, go to Burning Man to play, da da da, da. and there of course of course they do, um, but we we're we we're saying you know the yeah, we've sort of flipped things on its edge, right? For years, you know, the Burning Man staff produced Burning Man so the tech folks could play. And this time, <laughs> folks produced 10 Burning Man so the Burning Man staff would flopped. come back. <laughs> yeah, we're like, oh, well, this is great. They built Black Rock City and now we just get to show up. <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> it's always fun when things get upended, right? Things, the tables turn. Yeah, you know, you just got to see the humor in it, but you know, and, and then and then now there's some folks who are crossing over. I have had um, multiple multiple conversations with people who now have gotten the bug, right? They've gotten the, the taste of 3D creation or these virtual worlds or mm -hmm. throwing an event there, and people have come up to me and said, "Oh, you know, the things that I do in real life, producing events." producing things for humans, right? Producing, you know, worrying about flow of traffic and the location of, you know, things and, and how humans are all gonna occupy a space together or create together. So much of that applies now to some of these technologies. Um, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, I mean, and there's, yeah, you could throw a lot of that out the window. Well, you know? and there might be, you know, and the, that's what I'm finding now as I'm figuring out what are my, you know, next adventure is going to be and what, I mean, what I'm going to play with next um, is even though I've got a master's degree in computer science and 30 years of technology and done the infrastructure thing, a lot of the value is really just my ability to understand the, hum the humanity and how it intersects with now these immersive 3D, you know, technologies and experiences. Um, you know, you need like understanding both sides of the coin, understanding the technology, like what's really happening here, you know, with camera vision and sensors and 3Ds and six degrees of field. You know, and then what's really happening with the humans and then what are you trying to accomplish? Um, you know, it's now more relevant than ever. The real world things are applicable. And sometimes people might be better at the coding, right? Bless their, I've, I've been, I was an engineer forever, but not every engineer is good with the people stuff. Or the spatial stuff. Absolutely. And so the, the hybrid of, of yeah, you you need we need coding, but then sometimes people have the toys but they don't know what to do with it, and other people know what to do with the toys, but they don't know exactly how to make all the syntax work. You know. Well, it takes a team to put to to create something great, right? You need to have the right people in the right places, and you need to really understand how things work, both on the human side and on the technical side, to really create something amazing. And it, you, you know, it, you can't do it alone. It's, it's very, very few people, people do I, that I know are, are capable of being able to do, you know, use both sides of their brain, 
the entirely creative side to create this amazing environment and this amazing story, and then also have the technical know-how to build it and create it themselves. There's just so few and far people that are capable of, of being able to do that. And uh, I'm you know, rolling my eyes a little because I do that. <laughs> 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 but 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 I mean, you know, that doesn't mean I can claim complete mastery of all of the things. Nor do you want to. It's better to. It's better and more fun to work with other people. You know, it. it yeah. Even if you're just bantering, it becomes like jazz, you know, literally. Well, it becomes about like even these conversations, you know, a lot of time just go brainstorming and off into the wild blue yonder about ideas and, you know, different ways of doing things. And it's been really cool having all kinds of different people kind of week after week on this platform talking about all kinds of different things, you know, and just coming up with different ideas and speaking about you know, different different ways of even doing the same thing. And it's been really, it's it's really cool to have that feedback and that input uh, as a community. And it's just so important, so, so important to, to have. So much that's possible right now. I mean, technology now, 30 years after I, you know, sort of finished my formal form, that formal training on it is really getting, it's really getting interesting. You know, a lot of us who have been sort of lifetime geeks, you know, we are so inspired by things like that we saw in the movies or, you know, the, all the science fiction. Mm -hmm. And now like, this stuff is possible. Like finally we're getting the good stuff, you know? And uh, and, the, and the tools are becoming easy to use and, the, and what we can do with it. I mean, literally so many things are, the possibilities are limitless. You know, the ability for people now to be, live volumetric captured you know their, for their performances and then oh that's going to get even crazier now oh yeah and then broadcast, crazier now. broadcast on the televisions or into the palm of your hand or they're filming entire television shows you know in led sets you know mm -hmm. giant giant k and that's you know where they're creating i mean we can get into some like avatars and multiple dimension things you know i mean mandalorian Exactly. That's exactly the one that the making of that. I just watched that over and over, you know, kind of drooling with envy at the toys. <laughs> that the play with. And, you know, and so you think about it. So we have a world, we've, they've created a virtual world. And then you can visit a virtual world, both as an avatar or a flat screen, or then they take a virtual world and then they project it into the real world. And then they film another fake world within. I mean, we're, we're getting into a lot of layers of existence. We're getting into the matrix where you can have multiple worlds all within one. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I, uh, in one of the Burning Man platforms, I had gone on in my VR headset because you can fly and it's, why not, you have one. But then I was inviting other people to, for my birthday a couple of weeks ago to come have a party there. And I said, well, let me see what the 2D, let me see what the, the laptop experience is like. So I created another avatar. So, and then there's this moment when my headset is on downstairs and my laptop is on upstairs and I've got my purple me and I've got my blue me and we're like, and I keep switching back and forth and I'm looking, uh, looking at it and I'm taking selfies of me and my other avatar. And I was like, man, stuff is getting weird. Stuff is getting trippy. <laughs> So it's getting weird. I'm just cracking myself up. <laughs> I have to tell Isabel that Matrix Reloaded was one of my favorite ones. So I would say, yeah, this is like, this is like the re Matrix Reloaded reloaded. Yeah, I mean the rabbit holes, the, the 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 technological layers, and even creating like you know virtual realities, and you know there's philosophies that I've studied, you know, where it believes we are an avatar of some sort of potentiality. So then we're avatars creating avatars, and then and then having them all, and and what's projection, what's real? That's conversation for another time. But it can get really interesting, you know. And there's a responsibility too. Right. And yeah, there is responsibility. And there's like, yeah, there's also that human side of comfort level to all of that too, right? Some people don't want to show their true self. It's I, I like to look at it as the references is like ready, ready player one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Ernest was onto something when he was kind of showing these people living in a world as, a, as an avatar or persona of who they want to be as opposed to who they are inside of the human life. And yeah. that's really kind of an interesting concept when you really look at it, because there's just so many people that aren't really kind of comfortable with who they are. And they're always, they want to be somebody else, or they, they feel like they need to be something else than who they are, which is 
I've, yeah. I've always found kind of interesting to kind of look at that kind of in, a, in that parallel universe of, you know, who you are and what you want to be. Absolutely. I mean, I do wish I could have purple sparkles follow me everywhere in real life. <laughs> I can't. And, um, and also, but the, the technology can, in addition to, of, of course, my avatars, I make them cute because, you know, that's what keeps me entertained. But these immersive technologies in virtual worlds and, and, and games can also provide a place to discover yourself. I'm going to tangent off of the Burning Man, you know, thing uh, to it. I'm an advisor for a group called Andromeda Entertainment. They do self-care game publishing. And a former uh, staff member of theirs had gained some notoriety in the world because he became that guy who lost like 80 pounds playing VR games. What? And, yeah, yeah, and uh, a beautiful soul. And, um, and and so he was, and they have they have a game I played at lunchtime called Audio Trip, super fun, and and has been keeping me sane, you know, during this this whole pandemic, and and but he was, you know, helping them develop this game, and it was created by um, choreographers and fun music, and it was a little more interesting than just the the Beat Saber, you know, where stuff's flying at you. It's flow. It was helping you get in a flow state, and so by him testing this game like a couple of hours each day or at least an hour every day. And he was kind of a bigger, he's, he's, you know, he had some, some little heft to him. You know, he's a little round guy. And he, he, he knew it. He had been like 300 pounds, right? Or something like that. So he had been, you know, overweight. And, and doing this, joyfully doing this, and then dancing for an hour every day, he lost like 80 or up to 100 pounds. But what was really poetic, I met him at a, at a, a summit and, uh, it was sort of one of those, you know, gathering things, and there was there was a dance um, in the in the middle of it, and we were all dancing, and he was sweating and spinning around the dance floor and just owning it. <laughs> That's and awesome. You know he came up to me and he said, "This is the first time I've ever danced with real people." Really? And That's if that if that doesn't get you, it gets me, right? And and so yeah, so literally literally had been practicing his embodiment and begin getting comfortable with movement and learning how to be a new kind of person and, and practicing that in a game, in an immersive environment, and then was able to bust through that and step into a version of himself. Isn't, I just love that story. <laughs> yeah, that's a tremendous story. I think that's a, a fabulous way to kind of illustrate, again, you know, kind of breaking out who you are to what you want to be and doing the stuff that really that you're really passionate about you know there's just so much behind that so much behind that in general like i think it just goes so much deeper than a lot of people even truly know i think it's one of the biggest and best pieces of advice i could just we've been giving everybody is to just dive into your passions you know and not be afraid and do what you really truly love to do because that's where you shine you always truly shine when you're doing something that you're passionate about and that you love. And it's really sad to see so many people not in positions or not doing things, you know, just to be able to live uh, day by day doing things that they don't necessarily want to do. So yeah. I would just say always follow those dreams, no matter where you are, no matter how crappy it is or whatever job you're stuck in, you know, keep that passion on the side and keep on running with it. But, you know, confidence and boosting and self-discovery. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I when I started working at Burning Man, you know, I was I planted seeds in a lot of fields. I was a costume designer, I was a photographer, I was a technologist. Um, did I say photographer? You yes. know, I, I thank you probably, right? Um, say it again though. Double right. photographer. And, um, and and these things that were sort of disparate, right? And then and, and like different things that I love to do that but didn't necessarily make sense together. And then when I when I got this position, it all I say it all swirls together sometime like soft serve ice cream, right? So there I was. I was working on photography, you know, for Burning Man. I was doing a lot of that as volunteer, but then I was also producing the print calendar um, for them for almost 20 years. Um, and my technology aspect. And then I'm like, you know, costumed Halloween baby, like all of those things, which some of them, which were just what I liked and some of it were also what I knew and studied, they swirled together for like the next level up. And so you have to feed these other dimensions of yourself. And even if they don't seem like they have anything to do with each other, 
like there might be that moment when they all just combine to be like the next the next level up the next level up you know i one of the things i realized with um my last uh, you know project and i loved it immers immersive augmented reality and we were doing a lot of things for events and consumer entertainment a company called nclu um brought some you know cutting edge immersive consumer entertainment to the heart of san francisco and to some met many large events um and then covid but um you know is is honestly the the create the the side of doing that the designing these experiences and producing them and excellent hosting them and supporting them and creating content I, for literally the first six months, you know, of, of the job, I kept saying, when do you want me to start working? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I'm showing up to things and I'm making things happen and I'm helping to design experiences and I'm telling people where to move things around and nudging this and testing that and, and illustrating, you know, what, where, where the booth needs to go. And I'm just like, when do you want me to start working? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's when you know you're in your sweet spot, right? And, and that's Absolutely. what I had. When you don't even realize that yeah. you're doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're there. That's what I had to learn was, was it doesn't out, it doesn't always have to be hard. It doesn't have to, you know, yes, there's going to be meetings. Yes, there's going to be paperwork. But, but, you know, to really to just kind of keep leaning into the parts that you feel almost effortless um, because that's how you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly, I'm just saying that to myself as much as anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it, it's really, uh, it's really important. It's really important that you do keep, keep that motivation going forward. I mean, Priscilla, I've known Priscilla for years and years and years. Hey, Priscilla, honey, so keep, keep moving, uh, keep forward movement towards your dreams, embody the sea turtle spirit, slow and steady. And yeah. I couldn't agree with you anymore. Actually, I don't know if I could flex high enough, but I got a great big sea turtle on my ankle. See it really? <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That's Thank beautiful. you. I don't have any tattoos. Oh my gosh, you're one of those hidden one of those hidden freaks, aren't you? Yep, one of the hidden ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Heather, I wanted to thank you very much for kind of getting up to our time, but I wanted to thank you so much for, for coming on with me today. It's been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed it. For those of you who want to get in touch with Heather, uh, she's definitely very prominent on both Instagram and LinkedIn. So her LinkedIn profile is basically LinkedIn. You can look up her name, Heather Gallagher, directly, or you can go to Heather Gallagher-Camera Girl-Gallagher. Um, you can also check her out on Instagram at Camera Girl SF. Uh, which is her handle there. And uh, is there anywhere else that they should check out, Heather? Or are those kind of the best places to touch base I've, with you? I've been doing some writing. So I'm also, it's cameragirl at dot medium dot com, I believe is a place. So I wrote a lot about the Burning Man uh, virtual worlds as that they were happening. So if folks are interested in that, um, there's some fun, some funny stories and some insights into that experience. And that's another way folks can reach out to me as well. That's Awesome, 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 awesome. Yeah. Uh, to all of you too, you know, we've been kind of going going through this every week. Um, we uh, have our, our website or Patreon page, uh, Be Our Hero. Um, if you guys have anything to donate to help us keep this thing moving forward, that would be awesome. It could even be the smallest little thing through there as a one time, It'd be really great to have your support and help kind of keep this, this train on the tracks and rolling forward. Um, we also have, uh, of course, the swag area on the website with shirts and cups and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, my friend Jeff Grants on the show. Uh, he's an amazing person. He's done a lot of different talks, actually been on uh, some of the TEDx stuff. And he's the director of creative technologies at DCL Boston, who fabricates some incredible things, did a lot of work as well in the Hard Rock Hotel uh, down in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. So check that out next week. And uh, Heather? Thank you so much, so much once again for joining me today. It's been amazing having you on board. It's been a lot of fun, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And to all of you, you know, as I say every single week, time and time again, stay ahead of the curve, everyone. Take care. <laughs>